Okay, so that's why I came in. But why did I step? Why would somebody come in and do this for, for 36 years? And I'm going to use this guy right here, Norman Rockwell, to talk about this. Raise your hand if you know who Norman Rockwell is. Okay, that's good. There's a lot of people here. So, so what I'm going to say is going to resonate with you, I think, a little bit. But this is an interesting, interesting guy. You know, he tried to come in the Navy, but he only weighed 100 pounds. And he couldn't get in. But what he could do was he could paint. And he had the knack and the art of seeing things that we see every day, but we don't really see. He had what they call a discerning eye. He had the ability to portray a, a situation uh, with great depth. And uh, I, from, since I'm from Connecticut, uh, I became acquainted with his works kind of early on in my, in my life. But I, he did some things during the World War II period that really crystallized for me the whole notion of service. And there are things that I wish now today that I could, could have uh, shared with Coach Paterno. So I want to talk about some of his great words, but I want to show a couple of them right now and talk about you know, what this great skill set that he had was. And this is kind of the first one. Take a look at that. And it's good, the title of it is Marine Coming Home. Okay, so tell me, as you look at that picture, what's what do you see in that picture? What, what, do you, what are the important aspects of that? What's that blue star in the background? Mean? Somebody raise your hand and tell me what that is. What that blue star in the background is, and you see this on the back of cars all the time, you wonder, what is that blue star in the back of that car? That means that that family has a Marine or has a service member serving in, in the service, but serving overseas in a combat situation. You see, two stars means I got more than one. What if that was a gold star, what would it mean? Do you see those? Gold star means that they lost a loved one overseas on the back of the car. And you see them in the windows, in the homes. And this goes back to early in our time in the country. But as you look up there in the background there, there's a story that's talking about this guy being a hero, and there he is, he came home. You know, and so, what's he got in his hand? What's he holding? He's holding a Japanese flag. Okay, so given what I just talked about flags, and how precious they are, do you think that came easy? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think there was probably a major clash there that went on. And if you look at what he's wearing on his chest, he's wearing a couple of things. He's wearing a couple of ribbons that you can't really see him too clearly, but he's sitting there probably with his brother and maybe his dad and the local postman were trying to understand what this is kind of all about. And he's got that flag, which didn't come easy. But he's got two, two, two things there. He's got a purple heart, which meant he got wounded, and he's got a silver star there, which is a, uh, a different looking kind of a, a ribbon for valor and combat. So he's been awarded that, and been awarded that by the President of the United States. So what's that silver star all about? Okay, so that's World War II. Here's a kind of contemporary view. There's the award itself, the Silver Star on the left. And there's a guy by the name of Jim Capers, who's a good friend of mine, really close friend. And Jim Capers is my man. And he was the first battalion commander in the Marine Corps as a black officer. And he was enlisted in the Marine, enlisted in the Marine in Vietnam. And he got a doctorate promotion to lieutenant. And he was awarded this award, and he said, here's the reason why. The 13 man reconnaissance team was inserted in enemy territory and he was operating in an area of over 5,000 North Vietnamese and was ambushed. And they were looking at uh, a compound trying to figure out who was in it and uh, he had 13 Marines and everyone got in. And so some really, really brave helicopter pilots, and I know we got some helicopter pilots here today with us, uh, flew in there and uh, Pick these guys up one at a time. They couldn't land them because they're in the jungle. So they hovered above the jungle and they lifted them up with a winch one at a time. Wounded up in that helicopter. And there were other Marine airplanes around them that were keeping the enemy kind of at bay. And Jimmy Capers came up last. And Jimmy Capers was wounded 19 times when he went up in that helicopter. And uh, I want to tell you, in terms of courage and commitment to the country, here's the guy who came from Alabama, didn't have much. 
didn't have anything at all. Absolutely loves his country. Would give anything to both his Marines and to that country today. And uh, just a great American. But it's just an example of what kinds of actions occur for a guy to win an award like that. And in the Rockwell period, I used it to provide the context for what that is. I talked about Jimmy Davis being a black. And you look at this picture, it requires a little bit of explanation. And it's important. That black man sitting in the middle there is a black Marine. His name is uh, Gunner Sergeant Silva. And he's in charge of that whole thing. And that's also in Vietnam. And he's severely injured. And they're trying to pull him out to go back to the hospital. But he won't go. He won't go because one of his Marines is hurt. And he's trying to take care of him. So my point to you in this is that in this world in which I came to inside the Marine Corps, there is no color. There is no color. There's no color in the back. It's all about what we're trying to do, and it's all in the interest of our purpose. Okay, another picture. This one may be familiar to you. I think maybe something happened in school here recently, but her name is Rosie. So she is Rosie the Rosie the River. This is a cool picture done by Rocco. Okay, so I think you know probably what this was about, but this is World War II. So the Japanese and the, and the uh, Germans had over 95% of their military age males fighting. And they declared war on the US. And so we went to war simultaneously with both those countries. What percentage of the American population, American males, was actually uniform. If it was over 95% for them, what was it for us? Anybody know the answer to that? 10%? That's all we put in uniform. We had 20 million military age males, and only 2 million of them actually went into uniform. But what we did do, what we did do is we produced tanks and airplanes during that period of time like nobody's business. So a lot of people talk about roads to the river because all the men went to war. That's not really true. What we did is we turned up the entire industrial base. And women went to work in the factories. My mother, Bristol, Connecticut, went to, went to high school at 4 o'clock in the morning till 10. Came out, had lunch, and then went and made airplane parts at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, as did her mother, who was a teacher. But the whole country was focused on that. So Rosie the Riveter during this, during this time did great work. And women came in, women participated, had a great role in helping us to win that war. And I think uh, Rockwell portrays that well. You know, you notice when she stepped on it, it's hard to read what that is, but that's a copy of Mein Kampf. What is Mein Kampf? That's it with the diary. You know, so she's standing on it, you know. She's helping to win this war with a backdrop of, again, behind her. Okay, so there's a couple of pictures. And we'll get to the, to the main ones now, Rockwell's four prints on freedom. Where did they come from? This is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He is in his third term. This is eight months before Pearl Harbor. And he's addressing a joint session of the Congress. Kind of interesting, you know, it's kind of the same way today, you know. There are uh, the guys in the robes, the Chief Justices right there in the front and over on the side here are, you know, there wasn't a Secretary of Defense back then, there was a Secretary of War, we were organized differently in the Defense Department, but they're all sitting over there, and there's the President. The other interesting piece, if you could open this picture up, is there's no TV cameras in there. I mean, everything during this time is being done by radio, or by print media. So print media, the ability to write, and the ability to speak, is all the American public has to understand. So eight months before, the President knows he knows that we're about to go to war. It's coming. It is coming. So this speech he gives is about the four freedoms. And why does he do that? He does it because our strategy as a country has been isolationism up until 1940. Why, why isolationism? Where did that come from? Someone tell me. What happened? Why were we isolationists? Why were we not engaging within the world? 
We didn't like how World War I ended. We didn't like the fact that World War I even occurred or that we participated in it. So there was a notion inside the U.S. is that if we didn't engage outside the country, if we didn't go outside the country, then we wouldn't have to deal with the problems of wars, but they came to us. So FDR knew that things were going to change, so he talked about the four freedoms. Because he knew that those four freedoms were going to be the basis for a nation that was going to go to war. It was going to provide the purpose behind what we were going to do and who we were going to be. 